Churchill was one, and a group of 20 around him. The rest of them, consensus, 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 appease, 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 jaw, jaw is better than war, war, let not annoy the strutting masters of the universe, of the Third Reich, maybe they'll go to another universe and leave us all alone. <laughs> that was the consensus, near universal, every newspaper, even the BBC, well the BBC of course always gets it wrong, and so does the ABC. <laughs> You're working well with me here. <laughs> In the 1940s and 50s, the Lysenko consensus. Trofim Denisovich Lysenko. Now you won't have heard of this guy. He was one of the most influential figures of the 20th century because he directly killed 20 million people. He did it by accident because he was a peasant agronomist who had an idea and happened to mention it to the local Communist Party secretary that if you took seed corn and soaked it in water over the winter, rather than planting it out in the cold ground to get used to the weather in Russia, then by the spring, it would germinate more efficiently. There was no scientific basis for this, but the party secretary, recognizing a public relations coup when he saw one, said, Comrade Trofim, you have made a fundamental and useful contribution to Russian climate science because you are living in the Soviet Union, and therefore you are inspired, even without any education or qualifications of any kind, to make this contribution. And he passed him up the line to the regional party secretary, who made the same ridiculous speech, consensus all the way. And he went up to the general secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party itself in the Kremlin. And within a year or two, I kid you not, this man, this peasant, ignorant clot, actually, is the best description for him, was made president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. And for 20 years, they applied his ludicrous policy, and for 20 years they had failed harvests, and a million people a year starved as a direct result. And only after 20 million had died did the consensus suddenly melt away. What about the DDT consensus? You've already heard about this. 30 or 40 million killed. And it was only on the 15th of September 2006 that Dr. Arata Kochi of the World Health Organization, who was in charge of the malaria program, said, quite often in this field, politics comes first and science second. We will now take a stand on the science and the data. And he lifted that ban on DDT and recommended it once again as the front line of defense against the malaria mosquito which was still at that time killing a million people a year, nearly all of them children. And so in how many countries have they lived in the world? Very, very few. I certainly couldn't get DDT in the UK when I asked for it the other day before I went to Indonesia, malaria country. Who oh, no, said the doctor, it's been banned. No, I haven't. No, I, it isn't, I said, it's been unbanned. He said, no, I am on the left. I know that it's been banned and it can never be unbanned. He didn't care about the science, he didn't care about how many people his policy was killing. He didn't care the policy had been reversed by an official body. No, the consensus could not be wrong, and for him it stayed banned, as it does throughout the United Kingdom. And nearly a million people every year, nearly all of them children, continue to die because consensus, consensus, consensus kills and kills and kills. And then there's the HIV. <coughs> consensus. 33 million dead so far, 33 million infected and going to die. And why? Because instead of following the policy of identifying and isolating immediately all carriers of a new fatal incurable infection so that other people didn't get it, it's a pretty elementary policy and it worked with smallpox. With AIDS, who oh no, we mustn't discriminate against people who've got AIDS because it's so much more fun to discriminate against all the people who haven't. <laughs> and here is one of them. This lady got HIV. Her two previous sons died of it. Her son here, visibly sick, died of it a week later than this photograph. And she died a year after that. That is what happens to individual people if we carelessly say consensus, consensus, consensus. They die and die, and die. And when they're dead, they have no voice. But let us, nevertheless, be as kind as we can, 
and let's make the same concessions to consensus as both David and Joe have already made. There are various questions on the screen here. Is there a greenhouse effect? Does CO2 contribute to it? Are we adding CO2 to the atmosphere? Does that mean warming will result? Are we causing some warming? To all these questions, we concede. Concede, as we would have said in medieval disputation. We agree with the other side. And on these points, the science is settled. Not because there is a consensus, but because measurements have been done. Measurements which you can replicate and reproduce and check for yourself. So we know these things to be true. So when they say to you, Aaron, well, there's a consensus among 97% of scientists, they're right in so far as they're confined to the points that you see that me conceding to on the screen now. But as David has very fairly pointed out, there is no consensus about the one question that really matters in the debate about the science of climate. And that is, how much warming are we going to get if by the end of this century we roughly double the amount of carbon dioxide that is now in the atmosphere? Now, what the UN does, as you've seen, is to produce some very extreme predictions. And it does so using zitting teenagers, picking their noses, flicking the bogies, eating donuts, drinking coke, and playing with their Playstations and Xbox 360s. In other words, it's done by model. Now let's have a look at why models don't work. In science, there are some things you can prove. Many of you would have wrestled with the proof that the square on the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares on the other two sides of a right-angled triangle. Pythagoras' is theorem. Here is a complete proof without words of that theorem. I won't even explain it to you, it's so clear. And this is by Aryabhata, a 5th century Hindu mathematician. It's a darn sight simpler than Euclid's proof, which you were probably made to struggle with, which the philosopher Schopenhauer once described as a triumph of perversity. Here you have a simple, elegant, straightforward proof. And when something is proven like that, then you don't need a consensus on it. It doesn't matter how many people believe it to be true or don't believe it to be true. It is so. And that is proven. And here is my own proof of Pythagoras' theorem in a single frame, very elegant as I think you would agree. Let's give it a round of applause. <laughs> but the climate isn't like that. The climate, mathematically speaking, is chaotic. And the father of doing numerical forecasting, using computers to try to work out what's going to happen to the climate, was Edward Lorenz in a climatological journal in 1963. He wrote the celebrated paper on deterministic non-periodic flow. You'll be tested on that later. Um, which founded a new branch of mathematics called chaos theory. And what he said is that in view of the inevitable inaccuracy and incompleteness of weather observations, precise, very long-range weather forecasting would seem to be non-existent. It can't be done. And he proved it in 1963. So what then happens? Well, there are many chaotic objects. You may think that a, the oscillation of a pendulum that regulates clocks is an ordered activity, but occasionally it can become chaotic. So is the forecasting of population. So is, you, you'll like this one, the cricket scores exhibit mathematically chaotic tendencies. We would like to be able to predict who is going to win. You might expect that Australia would have won the Ashes, and even if she didn't win them, at least that she'd get them back. But who would have thought that England would both win the Ashes and then hold on to them next time round? <laughs> Just thought I'd rub it in. <laughs> of course it is, yes, quite right. <laughs> Somebody's got to show you Aussies who's boss. <laughs> so, here we are. Uh, even the simplest chaotic equation, and I'm sure I need not explain this one to you, um, uh, is, is something which can produce quite a complex output. And what we're going to do is make the equation draw a picture. And each little dot or picture on the picture, starting from top left to bottom right, will be a different value of what is known as the complex uh, variable C, the complex parameter C which is partly a real bit of a number and partly an imaginary bit of a number. Don't worry about that for a moment. But you can see it's actually quite a simple equation. And what you'll see is the top left and bottom right, right values of C 
are very near 